You cannot live the life of a privileged white person, settler colonizer, in a country, take away their rights, deny them their water, their land, and their freedom, and their life, and expect to sit around with no consequences. The whole of Plato's Republic is a, re is a reply to this character who thinks that it's all about, in modern parlance, I guess the Greek translation would be winning. Um, it's all about winning. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Maine to New York City. It appears that the people are rising up in Sudan against the 30-year dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir. In response to peaceful protest, his forces killed 37 people, according to Amnesty International. But still people come out day after day in protest. And there are reports that the army and al-Bashir's personal militia are only giving him half-hearted support. These are photos of solidarity demonstrations from Berlin, Paris, and Iowa City. Do remember that al-Bashir is the man most responsible for the massacres in Darfur. This was all a surprise. Al-Bashir was recently in Damascus giving a warm greeting to fellow tyrant Bashar al-Assad. This was not lost on Sudanese protesters. Speaking of Syria, Trump is pulling out U.S. troops from Syria with no effort at all to guarantee the safety of Kurds who had cooperated and done the bidding of the United States no effort at all to guarantee the safety of the people in al rukban The Kurds, led by the YPD, had hooked their stars to the U.S. Army. Now they've apparently agreed to let Assad forces back into the north in a desperate attempt to get protection from Erdogan and his Turkish army. Mistake after mistake. Unfortunately, the YPD never made much effort to ally with non-Kurdish Syrians and now may lose everything, including their noble social experiment. A columnist recently wrote a piece entitled, Syria Killed American Leila Shwekani, Why Does No One Seem to Care? Some people did care. Shwekani was from Chicago, and these people held up signs. And this sign was held up in Moscow. This is heartening. A brave, brave demonstration in the ruins of Dera, where the uprising in Syria first started and where people surrendered to Assad several months ago. So I'll sing the, the song I wrote for uh, Idlib, and um, I, I sing about you, Rania, you know that. <laughs> and uh, sing, sing about Raed and Sarut, uh, another uh, major figure. And I don't 
you know, some people criticize the song saying, why are you glorifying four individuals in the song? That's not what this revolution is about. Of course not. But we always have people who represent the revolution, right? I mean, without, I can, I can say everyone, but when you, when you say a person's name and you have that image of that person, you know what that person's about, whether it's Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Riyas Matar or Raid Ferris. Um, I'm not saying that he's the only one, but he represents something. because it was only after seeing her in those protests that I sang about her and then wanted to, I had to make sure it was okay to sing about her, so I had to get in touch with her 
and, uh, and asked permission, as well as from uh, another gentleman I mentioned in the song and pictured in the video. I wanted to get permission from him as well. I didn't want to put anyone in any, any danger. Um, I want, the next song I'm going to play, the, the, the other song, um, is the song that uh, I think really gels with Ryan's message. Um, I wrote this in, uh, I don't know, 2013 probably. And I've read this New York Times article <coughs> about a river uh, that was flowing with bodies and um, uh, from one place to another, just the entire river just seemed to be of human bodies. And, um, and the image was just, you know, seared into me. And, um, and I was angry at the US and world press for starting to label this a, a, a civil war rather than a revolution, because I, I think that when we started calling this a, a Syrian civil war, it made us feel as an audience like it wasn't our problem. Like, they, they're killing each other. We can't really help them. It's our, not our business. It's often what civil wars suggest. And uh, so I wrote this song to, uh, against that idea. I sing a little Arabic here in the chorus, so excuse my accent. In 
In Israel, state prosecutors have recommended that bribery charges be filed against Prime Minister Netanyahu. It will all be up to the Attorney General Mandelblit if Netanyahu is actually charged. A statement was published in a pro-Netanyahu newspaper saying Mandelblit will become the target of merciless attack if he indicts. Lo and behold, a few days later, the grave of Mandelbit's father was vandalized. Avi Gabi, the head of the Israeli political party Zionist Union, wrote, When you encourage violence against the left and thuggishly threaten the attorney general, it's no wonder people take the law into their own hands. We saw it where it led in 1995. Gabi is referring here to the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Gabi wrote, the man is the same man and the institutions are the same institutions. On Palestine, a clip from a debate, the Israeli Miko Pellet, author of The General's Son. There is no dialogue here. There is no bridge here. There's racism, violence, and there's the right of people to be free and fight for their freedom. When the people of Gaza march, and have been marching for months now, they're not marching into an international border, which they would have you believe. They're marching against a prison wall, a prison fence. Their lands, their home, their rights are on the other side. I grew up in a very, very patriotic Israeli household. The president of the state of Israel, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and I, and a father who was a general. In my case, it was the death of my 13-year-old niece in a suicide attack in Jerusalem. And that forced me into a journey into Palestine. You cannot live the life of a privileged white person, center colonizer, in a country, take away their rights, deny them their water, their land, and their freedom and their life and expect to sit around with no consequences. Resistance to occupation, to settler colonialism, to oppression is sanctified by international law, even with the use of arms. Nobody wants to see the civilians die, so Israel can stop bombing and murdering civilians. And it's very easy to throw this, this notion of destroying Israel, destroying Israel. What does that mean? It means destroying the privilege. It was Israel that established the reality where today all of Palestine, or like I said, as some may call it Israel, from the river to the sea, is one state. In 1948, the western part of Jerusalem was subjected to a 100% campaign of ethnic cleansing. Not a single Palestinian, not a single Palestinian family was allowed to remain. Not one. Now to say that there is any sense of coexistence in Jerusalem, which is one of the most racist cities in the world. I grew up in Jerusalem. I went to school in Jerusalem. We never saw a Palestinian. We never met a Palestinian. Open the gates, free Palestine, allow the refugees to return to their homes, and everybody can live together in peace. But you don't yeah. want that. Zionists are racist. And that is exactly what I said when we started here. As you recall last week, I announced that MEC is starting a campaign to get trade unions to back the teacher in Texas who was fired for refusing to sign a pledge not to boycott Israel. This is an article I was asked to write about it for New Politics. We'll link to it on The Struggle. Here's a bit of news from India. The Hindustan Times says that a general strike is being planned for January 
eighth and ninth, all the unions except the ones backing the right-wing extremist Modi are united in the call. If they all go out, the strike will encompass 180 million workers. AFL-CIO, take note. And now, the first part of a talk by Jason Stanley about his book, How Fascism Works. He gave the talk earlier this year at the R.J. Julia Bookstore at Wesleyan University. Well, professor Jacob Stanley is Jacob Yurowski Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. Before coming to Yale in 2013, he was Distinguished Professor in the Department of Philosophy at Rutgers University. Professor Stanley has four other books which have won several awards, and he is here tonight to share his latest book, which is just out earlier this fall, How Fascism Works. If you please join me in a warm round of applause for Jake. So I, I thought I would just talk through a bit of my book uh, and, uh, and then open it up for questions uh, because one thing about this topic is that all of us, reality has a way of catching up with uh, theory. So I think more and more people are well versed on the topic I shall be discussing. Uh, I recently spoke in Kiev to uh, members of the parliament and it was not really, I mean they were much more sophisticated than I am about the topics <laughs> about which I was speaking, although they had not, um, you know, studied them in school, they had experienced them. And I think we're, fine, we're, we're seeing that uh, in, in, uh, in our own politics and in uh, the politics of a number of countries around the world right now. Um, so uh, so I, I, my previous book was called How Propaganda Works. Uh, and in it, um, I argued that the topic of propaganda was, had been overlack, o overlooked in uh, political philosophy. Uh, it was a book aimed only at philosophy professors. It never occurred to me that people who are not philosophy professors would read it or care about it. Um, but suddenly I found, and so the, so the topic, what I, was, what I was discussing is that uh, from Plato onwards, uh, there, was, uh, there was a tension, there was sort of, liberal democracy was a system that people had always felt was vulnerable uh, to demagoguery. And, and so, the, so liberal democracy as a system was widely regarded by figures like Plato and Hobbes as far too idealistic, and even those who argued for it, like Rousseau, uh, held that there needed to be dramatic cultural changes in order to allow its possibility. Uh, there needed to be uh, no dramatic inequality, no, uh, no, no specific resentment that uh, a more proper, that, that arises from inequality. So you needed dramatic cultural changes in order to allow for liberal democracy. <clears throat> because otherwise, a demagogue would come and uh, foment fear and hatred, produce, represent himself as the, uh, as the savior and protector, and uh, uh, divide society, raise fear of one group, uh, and present himself as a protector. I'm going to use him and he for the demagogue, because I think for reasons that we will discuss, uh, so, uh, and present himself as the protector. Uh, and then and then end democracy. This is essentially the story that Plato tells in Book Eight of the Republic. Um, I'm often asked when I first started writing this book, how fascism works, and uh, got an agent. The standard question I was asked was, why a philosopher on the topic of fascism? Why would anyone want to hear a philosopher talk about this topic? It's about history. Historians are allowed to write about this topic, but not philosophers. But actually, if you go back in the history of philosophy, uh, you know, back to Plato's Republic, there's a character in Plato's Re Republic, Thrasymachus. And Thrasymachus confronts Socrates with the challenge. He says, just, you know, virtue is a weakness. Uh, it's all about power. Like, it's just power. And <clears throat> Plato was, of course, not defending democracy. But Plato is defending truth and knowledge against Thrasymachus. 
And Plato wants to describe the whole of Plato's Republic as a, re as a reply to this character who thinks that it's all about, in modern parlance, I guess the Greek translation would be winning. Um, it's all about winning. Uh, and, and everything else, like losers, you know, anyone who has any kind of sense of uh, justice is a loser. And this is what Thrasymachus is arguing. And Plato writes the Republic to respond. Plato writes the Republic to respond. And Plato argues that Callipolis, his city based upon justice, uh, requires, uh, has, I mean, philosophers love it because we're supposed to rule everything, but we're also very low, low paid in, in Callipolis, so that's not <laughs> something we like. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so the idea is that there's a city based on justice and philosophers, uh, and, and it's based on respect for truth and knowledge. So Plato sets, uh, sets up the dialectic of the Republic as a battle between power and knowledge and truth. Now Plato is of course no fan of democracy, but I think he's right that there's, a, there's always this battle between uh, a system based just on power and its alternatives that are based on, which are based on truth. And liberal democracy is based on truth. Uh, liberal democracy has two values, liberty and equality, and both are based on truth. You can't be free without truth. Nobody thinks that the people of North Korea are free. And why don't we think that we're, they're free? They're not free because they've been lied to. And if you've been lied to, then you don't know what you're doing. You know, you don't know why you're doing what you're doing. You're just basically, you know, acting almost randomly. Or someone else, the person who's lying to you, is controlling your actions. Because they're telling you false things and you're doing things for those reasons, but those are not real reasons. You don't know what you're doing. So tr liberty requires truth. We don't think that people who've been lied to are, are free. Um, uh, similarly, equality requires truth. And thus we conclude the year and show 777. That number has no particular meaning, but we like it. That's it. Have a good new year. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.